Welcome to the Richie Flow Nutrition Podcast. My name is Cameron Borg. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with David Rubenheimer and Stephen Simpson. David is a professor of nutritional ecology at the University of Sydney who specializes in nutritional and appetite regulation. His approach is comparative using ecological and evolutionary diversity to understand these interactions. David's studies of insects, fish, birds, and a variety of mammals have helped to develop a new approach to human nutrition-related problems, such as the dietary causes of obesity. Stephen is a professor in the School of Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Sydney as well. He has a background in experimental psychology, zoology, and nutritional biology. He's one of the world's foremost entomologists and nutritional biologists, and in 2015, he was made a Companion of the Order of Australia for eminent service to biological and biomedical science. David and Stephen have been working together for decades on a unifying approach to nutrition and energy balance. Their investigations began with the question of why animals in the wild are so capable of regulating their food intake as to avoid the conditions of excess that humans are experiencing at startling rates. This led them to investigate the impacts of various ratios of macronutrients on food intake in animals from locusts to primates. Their findings led them to formulate the protein leverage hypothesis, which broadly states that animals prioritize the consumption of protein and eat various foods until a target of protein is met. The more diluted the protein is with carbohydrate and fat, the more total energy must be consumed to meet this target. This idea is as close as you can get to a natural law in nutritional science and has enormous explanatory power, particularly with regard to the obesity epidemic. I really like their work as it incorporates broader environmental contexts into the discussion of nutrition, something that almost never happens. Their findings also yield meaningful insights into the trade-off between fecundity and longevity with regard to the signals protein intake gives to our body about the abundance of our environment. With all this being said, I really hope you enjoy the episode. All right, guys, thanks so much for coming to speak with me. Um, It's a real honor to get some time to talk to you guys because, you know, my career uh, in nutrition um, has been relatively short and you guys have been doing this for a really long time. And uh, your work has probably been the work in nutrition that has made the most sense to me. And I think it's probably uh, up there as the most important work in nutrition at the moment. So thanks for speaking with me. Well, that's high praise. Thank you, Cameron. That's high praise, yeah. Um, I'll take you back to my introduction to your work. Uh, David, you gave a couple of guest lectures um, at UCID when uh, I was in my first year of master's. And um, you gave a couple of lectures going through your work, talking about this protein leverage hypothesis, which we'll get into soon. And I remember sitting there during the entire couple of lectures going, why on earth would the body prioritize protein if it can't store it? I, I was thinking, wouldn't the body prefer to prioritize protein, uh, uh, fats and carbohydrates because at least we can store them? And after the lectures, you said, are there any questions? And I said, wouldn't it make more sense for us to prioritize carbohydrates and fats because we can store them? And you said, and I'll never forget because it was this real aha moment for me, you said, ah, it's because we can't store amino acids that we have to prioritize them. And it was this light bulb moment for me where everything made sense in a single instance. I, you know, a lot clicked in my mind about everything that I was, I was thinking about it at the time. And uh, that was a really, really important moment for me to understand how nutrition works, not only in humans, but also in other animals uh, as well, the, the same sort of ideas apply. So um, that was my introduction to your work. It was a really big moment for me. Um, so maybe we could just get a little bit of a background on your work and how you came to this hypothesis, which I think is more like a theory now, not so much a hypothesis. I think there's enough evidence um, to call it a theory. I'll just add to what you've just said, Cameron, is that I think often people get tripped up in the way that you did, thinking that um, interpreting prioritizing as being the same as maximizing, getting as much as you can. Prioritizing, in the way we use it, actually is a concept that references dietary balance. It means that on a daily basis, our own species and many others that we've studied regulate protein intake much more strongly around a specific target level, neither too little nor too much. 
and the primates that are studying the wild, many of them do exactly the same thing, but concurrently they maximize non-protein energy intake. So when fruits are available versus when fruits aren't available, in other words, in carb and fat rich periods versus uh, carb and fat poor periods, they eat the same amount of protein, but whenever those carbs and fats are available, they they really eat as much of those as they can, again, within limits, but always protein is, is regulated more strongly. And in fact, this um, you asked about how this all came about. It came about, um, I'm referencing primate work, but it actually came about through work that Steve and I did, um, not in the wild on primates, but on insects in the lab when we were back at Oxford many years ago, I think, you know, in the 30s years ago. <laughs> Not the 1930s, 37 years ago it started. And we asked the question, well, you know, how is it that other species are so damn good at um, selecting diets that are balanced and healthy, whereas our species appears to be so poor at it? Um, so we set about investigating this, and we um, basically invented an approach called nutritional geometry that enabled us to to separate our diets into the separate nutrients and then look at the way that those nutrients interact in influencing the behavior and physiology and performance of animals. And there, in that work, we discovered something we had um, expected all along from basic evolutionary reasoning, and that is that the species, the insects we were studying, didn't have a single appetite, but they had separate appetites for different nutrients. Nutritional geometry. So the one was fat. Um, well, initially not. We worked with herbivores that had an appetite for carbohydrate, for protein, for calcium, and for sodium. We've since found that this is pretty universal, and many species omnivores like ourselves also have for for fats. Um, then using nutritional geometry enabled us to study the interactions of those appetites in regulating food intake. We found that the strongest of those appetites is the protein appetite in the sense that it's, it regulates the intake of protein more tightly than others. And as a consequence, you can get animals to passively overeat or undereat fat and carbohydrates just by diluting protein with those or else concentrating protein relative to, uh, to those. And, and that's the word, work that actually led via a, a number, a large number of different species, including primates in the wild, to research on our own species, seeing whether we had the same biology and responded in the same way to manipulations in the balance of our diets. Yeah, that's a great distinction between maximizing and prioritizing. Um, very, very different when it comes to brass tacks when you're looking at those two things. Um, what I love about nutritional geometry, the way the way that I see it is that it basically comes as close as you can get to a natural law in the field of nutrition, which is notoriously fraught with um, all of these confounding factors. So when you have something that is basically as close as you can get to a mathematical equation, uh, you can start to put the pieces together from there and build build your way up. Um, in your in some of your papers, you have these beautiful graphs where, on the y-axis, you have plotted um, cumulatively fat and carbohydrates, and on the on the sorry on the y-axis you have those. On the x-axis you have protein, and you see these beautiful plots of when you like you said dilute protein, um, you have to uh, increase the amount of uh, relative fat and carbohydrate you eat to achieve that same protein target. Um, how does this apply in the current state uh, of the obesogenic environment that we're in at the moment? Well, what's happened? Sorry, Steve, you go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I, I just grabbed that one. The um, the thing that was really obvious to us when we started to look at human data, and particularly across that period when the obesity epidemic um, came across the globe, and that was probably from the late 1950s, particularly up to around 2000, was that if you look at the increased calorie intake that drove that and there was an increase in calorie intake inexorably over that that period of time that was the primary driver of the obesity uh, epidemic those calories came as fats or carbs or both depending on the 
particular human population you looked at. But protein intake stayed exactly the same or remarkably similar anyway over time, hardly changed and didn't contribute the calories um, that have expanded our waistlines. They came from fat and carbs. And the whole argument for those, um, certainly the last 40 years, has been around is it fat or is it carbohydrates that that, that have been the, the culprit in driving this increased intake. And people have said, well, it's obviously not protein. And we flipped it on its head and said, well, actually, from what we know about specific appetites in other species, the fact that protein has remained so consistent suggests that it's being regulated. And therefore, if its concentration in the diet has changed, as, as David said, that's going to passively drive changes in total energy intake. And maybe then protein is the cause, the fundamental cause, um, influenced by all other things that are happening in the environment. And that speaks to your question just now. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. Um, I think the the idea that when you d dilute protein, you have to overconsume or relatively overconsume to reach the same target is really telling of, of where we're at. Um, like you said, the the protein consumption has stayed relatively similar, except the carbohydrate and fat um, intake has increased quite dramatically. Um, now you talk about the separate appetites that we have, the three macronutrients and also sodium and calcium. Sodium is probably not that difficult to understand. I think everyone realizes they have they have an appetite for sodium, um, some a lot more than others. Um, but calcium was a bit of an interesting one for me to understand because I've never, you know, it's it's not it's not like so sodium where you have that that salt taste on your tongue. You don't necessarily go, oh, I'm really craving some calcium rich food. Um, how is uh, our calcium appetite? How does that play into this, and and um, what does that lead lead us to? What decisions does that lead us towards as far as food is concerned? Well, calcium appetites are very clearly demonstrated if you look across the animal kingdom. So, if you look at calcium intake during periods of egg laying in birds, in skeletal developments in in um, many species, um, animals do seek out and regulate their intake of calcium really very precisely. So phenomenologically, it's, it's clearly there. It's a specific appetite. How it translates into taste and how it translates into um, mechanism for calcium regulation is not fully resolved. And it, as you say, it doesn't have the same access as saltiness and sweetness and umami um, savoriness do for the other major um, nutrients that are regulated. But there is, there is a calcium taste response and there are receptors specific to calcium, both um, orally and throughout our uh, intestine and in various other organs as well. So there is a physiology and a mechanism for regulation um, of calcium, and the calcium receptor is now increasingly well understood, um, often also responds to amino acids. So there's an interesting coupling between um, potentially at least protein and calcium detection. But the appetite system isn't really as well understood as it could be, but nor in many ways are any of the specific appetites because we've had decades um, where the, the sort of prevalent view has been that appetite is a single thing and it's, it, it's to do with energy and energy balance rather than specific things. And as David said, that was one of the key innovations that came out of our work. And if you think about it, Cameron, um, is every reason to expect that there would be an appetite, as we see throughout the animal kingdom, for calcium? Because calcium, uh, it's a micronutrient, but it's a special micronutrient. Sometimes it's referred to as a macro-micronutrient because it's required 
um, in such large quantities in the body for, as Steve said, building bone is running nervous systems. It's involved all over the body. Um, so not only is it um, required at relatively large levels in the diet as of true macronutrients, but it's also highly essential for performing uh, critical biological functions. We see, I mean, my work on giant pandas, for example, shows that they will migrate over long distances. I think I might have lectured to you on that, just to get enough protein or uh, calcium to balance the protein, calcium, and phosphorus ratios within their diets. And you see in agriculture, you see um, yeah, animals, herbivores accessing licks. Calcium is part of that. I've seen wild deer eating bones. You see birds specifically targeting lime mortar for calcium, as Steve said, all over the place. So it's a special nutrient. Yeah, and I, I've seen um, guys like National Geographic photographers always go to salt licks because they know the animals are going to be there and it's a great place to take photos. Yeah. Um, one of the things uh, you have both pointed out is that, you know, I guess for someone listening to this, they might go, well, if we have an appetite for calcium and sodium, why not have a specific appetite for zinc and copper and all of these other nutrients, given that they're all important? And I guess the, the, the point is that if you can prioritize very important things first, that ends up taking care of a lot of the other downstream things. So you don't need specific appetites for things like zinc, because generally speaking, if you're eating enough protein, particularly from animal sources, the zinc and copper and, and all of the other micronutrients are coming along for the ride anyway. So you don't need to evolve specific appetites for those things, which seems like a, a really brilliant um, thing that nature has come up with that allows us to not have too many resources devoted to all of these different appetites. If we prioritize the most important things first, all the other things essentially come along for the ride as well, which uh, I think from... Oh, uh, the view of being able to implement the ideas that you have come up with. It's very easy as someone who works um, as a practitioner, working with people trying to help them understand food. If you tell them just prioritize protein at each meal uh, for satiety, that will take care of 80% of your problems. We can tweak it from there. It's very easy to implement um, with people who um, you know might not want to know a lot about the ins and outs of nutrition. You need to add to that very critically is that you need to do this on a whole food diet, in other words, in a whole food environment, because what processed food has done is disrupted those correlations that you refer to. If we prioritize protein on processed food in a processed food environment, as is a major problem in contemporary industrialized food environments, all sorts of problems arise. One, of course, is that that protein is diluted with fat and carbohydrate. And that means prioritizing protein causes us to overeat energy when we're prioritizing protein. Those. The other, of course, is that micronutrients are stripped out. So the correlations are broken between the biological expectation that if we just regulate protein and fat and carbohydrate, everything else is going to come for, along for the ride. That doesn't follow in, in industrialized food environments. And fiber has also been stripped out. So you're not getting a lot of that satiating um, volumetric feedback, nor are you slowing the rate of digestion or feeding the microbiome that contribute to nutrition in their own right, as well as being uh, intrinsically part of our appetite control physiology. So that's that's another crucial part of it, exactly. I'm I'm busy studying. We're not the only species. I'm studying rhesus macaques in China, populations that live in the wild and populations that have been in contact with tourist populations um, with tourism for different periods of time. And they get exactly the same things as we do. They get fat on the processed foods that they're scavenging from tourists and all sorts of micronutrient deficiencies. So, so there is a second instance of the nutrition transition in another species. Yeah. It's fascinating that we're, the, we're not the only ones that this is happening to. I'm sure domesticated animals are suffering in the same way that we are. I'm sure we're all aware of you know people with very fat cats or dogs. Um, something that um, that I really like 
about the book, there's a there's a quote, um, nothing about nutrition makes sense unless you understand the biological context in which the species evolved, ours included. Um, there, there, are, there are a lot of people who would say nutrition is kind of like a laughing stock in the world of science um, because you can almost set up a, a study to prove whatever you want. Um, and I think this quote really gets to the heart of, of how we're really going to understand what's going on and how to get out of this uh, obesity epidemic. Um, what, are the, what is the context in which you're referring to in, in this line from the book? Well, it, it, it's a paraphrasing of a very famous, um, it was Dobzhansky that, who said it, wasn't it, David? Nothing makes mm. sense except in the light of evolution. Mm. Um, and and it's, it's a comment about the ways in which organisms have been fashioned and have evolved in response to their environments under the powerful influence of Darwinian natural selection. It's, it's an extraordinarily powerful way of devising optimal solutions to very complex problems and simplifying those complex problems such that the essential elements are controlled and everything else that can, as you said, comes along for the ride. And I think it, it gave us a framing within which we could not only conceptualize nutrition, but also um, really seek inspiration from other animal species and not even animals beyond animals. We worked on things like slime molds, which aren't even classified as animals yet, are able to regulate precisely their intake or their absorption um, of multiple nutrients separately. So if a slime mold or a cockroach or a fish or a baboon can do it, why can't we? And how do they do it? And what are the essential ingredients for nutrition and nutritional regulation that you can uh, understand by looking across the animal kingdom? So we came from the world of evolutionary biology, and that's been our different approach from the traditions in certainly human dietetics research. And you, you nailed it in your introduction, Cameron, when you said that, you know, thinking about nutrition in the way that we have is like the periodic table. Now, what the periodic table does is provide a structured set of rules that maps well onto the reality, the chemical reality around us. And evolutionary biology is the source of similar structuring in the conceptual foundations of all of biology. And what we've done is we've built on that and specifically fashioned a different way of thinking about nutrition in the way that evolutionary biology has previously informed so many other fields related to, um, to uh, uh, you know, reproduction, for example, to social organization, mating systems, and just not nutrition up until we um, have developed the approach that we have. For the reason that Steve said, it was just the sort of tacit assumption that it's all all about energy. But of course, you know, it's evolution, basic evolutionary principles will tell you that won't be true. And so it isn't. It seems like our um, satiety mechanisms and our seeking of specific nutritional components evolved in a wild setting for us and the price that we have paid for emerging out of that wild setting is a dysregulation of these perfectly tuned mechanisms that only really work in a wild setting and once we're out they sort of fall apart um, one thing you guys said in a podcast that i listened to recently was that you know when you think about something like a white potato which has been you know selectively bred over you know a substantial period of time it's, it lies somewhere between a whole food and a processed food because of the way that we have bred it um, to yield, you know, more starch uh, and less fiber, essentially. That's what a lot of these commercialized plant varieties have, have done exactly that. You know, they, they want to be sweeter. They want to be um, larger fruit, um, less fiber so that it's more palatable. 
Whereas, you know, if you go to hunter-gatherer societies, like you say, the tubers that they get are, are quite woody. You know, they have to peel. A lot of it is so fibrous that you're basically eating um, like the husk or the 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 bark of of a tree to get to the the starchy inside. Uh, and a lot of the nu uh, nutritional content lies in things like the skin or the thing that has the interaction with the environment. Um, and I found that really interesting to think of these um, these crops that we have now as somewhere between a whole food and a processed food, not at all suggesting that they're bad, but uh, it is important to consider that the way that we have processed these foods by selectively breeding them ultimately impacts the nutritional content and the way that our society uh, satiety um, mechanisms work around them when we're consuming them. And there are really two, two forces behind that before, as you say, we get to food processing. The first force is, is breeding for, as you've said, for palatability, for acceptance, but also breeding for healed. And, and what that means is fast growth in grains, for example. And what things grow fast is not fiber or protein, but starch from photosynthesis. So that's one of the things, a sort of profit prerogative has driven an increase in carbohydrate content relative to both protein, micronutrients, um, and also fiber. But the other more surprising and quite alarming um, force that's pushing it in the same way is, is rising concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. A large body of research has now shown that increased growing plants in carbon dioxide enriched atmospheres does exactly the same. It increases the starch content and specifically through different mechanisms, not just through dilution, decreases both the protein and the fiber content. So we've got these two things, three things pushing simultaneously in the same direction and engaging our regulatory mechanisms in the way that protein leverage proposes. No, no wonder we have an obesity epidemic. And if you add to that um, the subsidization of particular staple industries and the corn industry in the US is a classic example uh, which gave rise to the high fructose corn syrup industry, the sweetening of ultra processed foods, the uh, export in of subsidized corn around the world, which degraded food systems elsewhere. You you suddenly find um, massive global challenges emerging out of what ought to be um, healthy whole plants. Um, deriving a substantial part of our um, calorie intake. And it's quite interesting, just picking up at a point you made earlier, Cameron, you said that these mechanisms that we speak of evolved in a wild setting. And that's true, but I'd add to that not a single wild setting, there are many different wild settings in which human regulatory mechanisms operate really well. Just look at the distribution of our species across the globe. Um, and look at the range of ecologies that we inhabit. Um, unfortunately, there's one in which they don't operate well at all, and that's a setting in which commercial criteria take over from biological ones, and that's what's driven these trajectories that we've been speaking about. Foods are fashioned for profit, not for health or environmental sustainability. Yeah, and I, I think the same is happening in livestock. Um, you know, you have a look at the fat content of beef, for instance. It probably relates nothing to the wild meats like venison um, that are extremely lean, even kangaroo, uh, extraordinarily lean um, meats. And they the beef that we have today is probably much uh, a substantial amount higher in relative fat compared to these wild sources of meat that, that we were getting, which is, again... Um, if we were to eat to the same protein level, we're consuming so much more fat um, yep. from the meat that that's increasing our overall energy consumption. And again, not suggesting that beef is bad or anything like that, but it it, it plays into what we're talking about, that our environment has shifted um, to a point where we need to start paying attention because if we don't pay attention, we consistently run the risk of uh, getting imbalances with our nutritional intake and over a long period of time that can really hurt us at a population level. Interesting, much the same drivers underlie 
the increased fat in domesticated um, in farmed animals as what underlies obesity in humans. So, for example, we work with aquaculture industry, and there it's dilution of protein causes salmon, for example, and other species to overeat um, carbohydrates and fat and put on body weight, which is acceptable because just like carbohydrate in growing grains, the thing that's easiest to increase mass in growing a fish is fat on protein. So the same trajectories are pushing um, in the uh, direction of excess body fat in the animals that we eat, eat as in our, our, ourselves. And wet weight growth is is what's prioritised in a food, well, in a fish production system. Um, and I, I remember we looked at this, Dave, didn't we? That wild animal meat is typically less than five percent fat, and wasn't it a typical beef or sheep um, it was about twenty, wasn't it? Twenty mm. to twenty five percent. So. You're exactly right. That's a massive change. Yeah, it's 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 really worth taking note of. I think even even though, like we're saying, you know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with a a modern potato or a, or a modern you know um, steak, but we do need to take this into account. One of the main things I really wanted to ask you guys about is the other things that sit around food consumption as, as this context thing that we are talking about. It's well known, for instance, that if you extend the light period um, by using artificial light in chickens, they will lay more eggs for a longer period of time. Um, I want to ask you about the circadian effects and the seasonal and latitude effects that impact our um, our body's propensity to put on weight. Obviously, the further away from the equator you get, you do actually want to um perhaps even become pre-diabetic to put on a lot of fat mass to survive the winter. And I think that's sort of an adaptive mechanism where you do actually want to, um, you know, basically break your metabolism in a way that favors fat storage um, during the summer periods when things are plentiful uh, in order to survive the cold when you, you may not be able to provision as much nutrition as you otherwise would. How have these things like circadian rhythms, light exposure, um, you know, distance from the equator, how does that play into what you guys have been looking at? Well, the, the seasonal and latitudinal effects that you mentioned are, are exactly as you say. So um, hibernating mammals do become diabetic, not even pre-diabetic. You'd count them as full-blown type 2 diabetic. Yeah. They lay down body fats, they feed selectively on fat-rich foods during the lead up to um, the end of autumn, beginning of winter. So they're, they're very clearly demonstrated in a whole range of species and migrating species you'll see big changes too in their propensity to lay down body fat. Um, um, but I'll, uh, coming right back to much shorter timescales, our circadian biology um, the clocks that sit within all of our cells that regulate the circa 24-hour periodicity of the activities of all of our cells and organs, and every cell in your body has its own little molecular clock, and there's a master regulator clock in the brain in the suprachiasmatic nuclei, and it communicates and coordinates the other body clocks using hormones like uh, melatonin, serotonin, and so forth. Those same molecular clocks are intimately integrated into insulin signaling pathways, metabolic signaling at that level, and timing in the circadian system are really cross talk. Uh, they're cross talking, they're interconnected, and hence our daily cycles of eating and sleeping are really embedded in our fundamental meta metabolic biochemistry. And if you disrupt that, and you can do that in various ways, including um, staying awake when you should be asleep, looking at screens, um, disrupting your circadian biology in a whole range of other ways, shift work, um, long haul travel, you you directly influence your metabolic systems that underlie appetite control and 
the way in which you partition the energy that you've consumed um, when you eat. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things that I've been really concerned with, perhaps, well, not perhaps, more than, more than I think food is important, is the light environment that, that we now live under. Uh, I think our light environment has probably shifted even more than our, our diet um, over the last century. And I think what we're doing by living under artificial light, particularly that's rich in the blue spectrum, is basically telling our bodies that it's summer all the time, store, store fat, you know, um, basically it's forcing our uh, metabolisms into a, a state of abundance where everything is, you know, you have sufficient fat and, and carbohydrate calories coming in, often uh, diluted protein, and it's the perfect signal to the body to say store fat. And I think my concern is that uh, this light environment is being quite overlooked. Um, and I'm, I think that it actually might play quite a large role in what you guys are talking about, because it might be disrupting the exact mechanisms that you're looking at. Um, and, you know, it's, it's quite clear. You mentioned, um, uh, I think it's, I'm probably going to say it wrong, but Wilhelm, uh, Stephenson, the, uh, Arctic explorer who wrote the fat of the land. Um, mm. and you know, it's clear that humans can survive off very different diets based on where they are around the world. Um, and the light environments are, supremely different, uh, whether you're in Norway versus, you know, Vietnam, uh, and obviously the adaptations that have come along with living in those places have helped compensate for the, the different foods that you're able to get all of the different environmental cues. Um, you know, is this, is this something that you think is, you know, perhaps equally important as to the, the specific nutritional content of the diet? Yes, um, and you you certainly see populations. If you look at the Inuit, for example, um, reliance on a, a very high animal based diet, um, lots of fat in their diet. Their, much of their carbohydrates comes in the form of glycogen, again from animal organs. Um, they have a totally different diet to, let's say, traditional Okinawan Japanese, where their diet is 70% carbohydrates from sweet potatoes and, and a low proportion of protein. And you see associated with that, of course, changes, um, evolved changes in metabolic physiology and digestive physiology and all sorts of associated um, physiology. So for example, the, the Inuit have a mechanism to help prevent them going into ketosis so that they can rely on an even lower concentration of carbohydrate than perhaps would tip us into ketosis. There's a whole set of um, adaptations that have occurred across populations. Um, we think some of the habitual diets and, and their physiologies have predisposed some populations more than others to be susceptible to a Western diet. Yep. Um, we hypothesized around, for example, oceanic populations who have a high protein, high fish um, based diet might be more susceptible when they came into a, a low protein Western diet. And perhaps that helps explain uh, the susceptibility to diabetes and obesity and, for example, um, Pacific Islander populations. The, there are many examples where you can hypothesize. Um, actually getting the evidence to support that is a, is a different question. Um, and the other thing, of course, is if you extend light across the day, you extend the period during which people are able to eat. And we have less intermittency in our feeding and that itself is also known to be uh, an issue but again it might be worth we were speaking earlier on about the value of looking at the natural world um uh, referring to your your blue light idea um the problem potential problem with that is that many the temperate primates that i've studied put on weight they put on fat not in the summer they put it on in the autumn 
and usually late in the autumn because the summer is the time, the spring and summer is the time that the staple seeds are being grown by the plants and then they're eaten just the right time before it gets cold, before they become limiting during the autumn and sometimes the late autumn. Um, so I don't think that there will be a simple correlation between blue light, blue light um, incidence and physiology of putting on fat. And besides, we know that homeostasis doesn't operate based on responses to external cues independent of the state of the animal. And we know from all sorts of work that animals monitor their internal state and integrate that information with external cues like light. So the response to blue light will depend on their current um, physiological situation as much on the, as the wavelength of the light that they're responding to. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's all integrated together. You integrated. Can't, you, yeah, you can't take anything um, singly. You have to consider everything together. And there's a good example of this in situations where primates have had a very good um, previous season, they put on less weight in the subsequent autumn because they're putting on weight not to cue, but to requirements. That's very interesting. Yeah, and it's it's interesting you also point out this um, uh, intermittency between the eating and the fasting periods as well. Um, Sachin Panda has been doing a really great job in covering the right. the effects of that and, and even just eating the same amount of energy in a shorter period of time has massive metabolic consequences. So all of, like you said, all of this plays in together, the light periodicity, the period with which you're eating, what you're eating, all of this has to be taken together, which I think a lot of nutrition research actually fails to consider all of these contextual components that surround what's what's going into the stomach. Um, they just focus on the, you know, the chemical composition and and then that's sort of it. So that's why I really like what you guys are doing. Um, something that I found really interesting about the book was there's a, a sort of a praise by David Sinclair on the back. And uh, one of the most important things I think that comes out of this is this discussion about the trade-off between fecundity and longevity. Um, and you guys, I think, are probably uh, among the most um, well-read and most capable of speaking to this point because you've got different camps um, with regard to longevity. And I think most most of the guys out there, like David Sinclair, are very much um, talking about a low protein intake to um, increase longevity. Um, how does this? How do you see this playing out? This trade-off between fecundity and longevity? Because you know, I'm I'm young. I don't necessarily want to be um, putting fecundity, you know, aside and trying to live as long as I can just yet. But there may be a time, you know, in 10, 20 years where I want to start thinking about that. So, how do you see this playing out? Well, the, the, the trade-off is, is well known and people have tried to explain it for many years. And there, there are some you know, high-profile ideas around why it is that you can either have lots of babies or live a long time, but not both at the same time. Mm. Um, some of them are to, to do with you've only got a fixed amount of reserves and you spend them on one at the cost of the other. Others are uh, to do with more evolutionary arguments that uh, evolution doesn't see your post-reproductive years, so genes that might be valuable to you um, during early life, during reproductive life, can come back and bite you later in life. So there's a whole series of arguments like that. We took a rather different view, and, and, and that was to say, well, Let's consider the nutritional requirements of both reproduction and longevity and see whether they're the same or not. And, and the answer, perhaps not surprisingly, is no, they're different. So the nutritional response landscape in our models for how for living longest or being maximally reproductive are quite different. So the diet that you require to live long is a different diet to the one that you require to be maximally fecund. And as you say, a lower protein coupled with a higher complex carbohydrate ratio is what supports 
longest lifespan, if you keep an animal from birth on that dies all the way to the time when it dies. Um, what we then went on to show is that actually the probability of your dying at different life stages um, is a function and a changing function of diet across your life course. So when you're in your midlife as a mouse, and we think similarly in a human, a relatively lower proportion of protein um, is, is best for your minimizing your risk of dying. But when you become old, you need a higher proportion of protein in your diet. Or when you're reproducing, you need a higher proportion of protein in your diet. Because the requirements to support those things, including um, your loss of protein as you get older, um, requires a change in diet and your regulatory physiology, your appetites uh, track that as you go through your lifespan. Um, so the, the relationship between reproduction and aging is, a, if you like, a, an epiphenomenon of the fact that they're different processes that require different optimal mixtures of nutrients, hence different diets. And it's hard to achieve both optimally, maximally on the same diet as a result of that. Yeah, it's really interesting that, you know, we basically get this choice whether to prioritize um, having offspring or putting that on the back burner and trying to live as long as possible until we get the signal that things are abundant again and then and then we can prioritize having offspring. Is there a general um, sort of framework that um, you have sort of thought about that might be best for prioritizing fecundity in when we're in, our, in the first half of our life or in the reproducing years of our life, and then, you know, switching over to a um, more longevity-focused dietary pattern, and then perhaps into old age when sarcopenia and, and lower appetite becomes a problem, going back to a higher protein, you know, um, higher energy sort of diet. Is that sort of a... a what you guys have have come to? Yeah, well, it, it, we've got to think about how that applies in modern societies. I mean, the number of people in the sort of society that we live in that are, have limited fecundity because of diet can improve their fecundity to a level beyond what they're already capable of, and one to do so is very very limited. Um, so I really wouldn't think about um, about eating diets that prioritize fecundity as in to the extent that it's going to trade off against lifespan in the long term. There are plenty of diets that will give you a long and healthy lifespan and maintain fecundity at the level that we all want it. We use contraception just for that reason. If you wanted to prioritize fecundity, the first stop would be no more contraception. Um, so, so I think that it's different thinking about these things in an evolutionary and experimental context than thinking about their application in our society. But but still, you're exactly right, Cameron, that that your your requirements as a pregnant woman, for example, are different from your healthy diet when you're in your 40s, which is different again when you're in your 70s. Mm. Um, and and reflecting that in the composition of the diet across the life course is is, is a sensible trajectory for an individual. Um, but Dave's absolutely right. We're, we're hardly um, concerned with maximizing our reproductive potential as humans. No, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. um, it, how important is the balance of essential amino acids um, that you're eating? Because obviously we're talking about protein. Protein is made of amino acids. And the, the, the balance of amino acids in, is different in different foods. So is the balance of amino acids uh, an important factor in this? Like does cysteine, um, the the amount of cysteine and methionine ma matter? Can you have low methionine and cysteine and, and up branch chain amino acids and have less, um, you know, less impact on longevity than if you were eating uh, proteins that were lower in those amino acids? Well, uh, amino acid balance matters a lot, um, and it, it's a classic piece of stoichiometry. You've got 20 different amino acids, nine of which 
you rely on in your diet or from your microbiome, and they need to be in in the right relative proportions or in, in the right proportions across um, the 20. If you drop out any single one, then you will have uh, particularly essential amino acids, you'll have really drastic consequences, and that'll be reflected physiologically. Um, you can take out some, particularly the sulfur amino acids, as you've mentioned, do seem to be a bit special when it comes to longevity. Branch chain amino acids seem to be a bit special when it comes to causing metabolic disruption if their intake is too high. Um, and, and so clearly there are signatures that are linked between individual amino acids and outcomes such as those. But I think our research has helped show that the ratios really matter as well. Um, we did experiments, for example, in mice where we added branch chains. And to do that, you have, by definition, to reduce concentrations of non-branch chain amino acids, and we discovered it was the ratio of one to the other that mattered more than branch chains per se. And right. that's a that's a general conclusion from everything we do. The interactions matter, and you can't understand nutrition by looking at single things, whether right. that be amino acids or carbohydrates. Your work is very broad-reaching. I mean, we we've spoken about how even things like the relative concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is impacting our food choices. Um, you know, so this, well, your work sort of ties in a lot of different things and, and points them all back to this, um, you know, very sort of parsimonious, um, mechanism that evolved, um, not only in us, but, you know, everything down to fruit flies. And like you said, um, you know, fungi, uh, all sort of look uh, work on this on similar sort of mathematical principles in a sense. Um, where does this take you and your work from here? Um, but both of you working together. Well, it's just a continuation of the approach we've taken all along. Is that biology isn't a collection of parts um, any more than nutrition is a collection of nutrients. It's a complex system of interacting things. And those interactions, as much as the parts that interact, are what is really important. And we've spoken, particularly Steve's spoken quite a lot about the complex metabolic interactions, metabolic systems approach to metabolism. What we're doing now is we're extending that to a systems approach and ecosystems approach to human food environments. And we're finding that not only is it a necessary extension, but there's fantastic value in bringing that metabolic perspective into understanding human food systems. So, for example, the hormone that we've now identified as playing an important part in regulating the protein appetite that is at the center of much of what we do. You can really predict and understand things in a food system context based on what we know about that neutral, that, that hormone. So, so it's, it's bringing together the metabolic and the ecological systems approaches, which is the way we've always worked together. Steve's been more on the sort of uh, metabolic mechanistic side, and I've always been more on the ecological side, um, ecosystem side. And we've met in the middle saying, look, nutrition is central to both of these things. And now we're getting to the stage in the context of humans where we can see how they link up together fundamentally, profoundly. It's been a, an incredible thrill to be able to integrate within a single um, set of models, everything from molecules to global systems um, in a coherent structure that allows us to, to navigate from one level to the other and back again and understand how those systems interact. Um, and I guess that was beyond our wildest dreams when we sat together in a dark, um, hot room, mixing up 28 different foods or 25 different foods, wasn't it, to feed to a couple of hundred locusts back in Oxford um, 
30 odd years ago. And measuring food dishes and counting feet or pellets was the way we used to collect data. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it must have been a pretty special moment when you guys started to plot all of these um, things on the graphs and started to see these patterns emerging. I mean, you, you must have had a um, a pretty good laugh when when these graphs started to to come together with these brilliant um, patterns uh, emerging out of the the plots. Um, I can't imagine what it would have been like to be vindicated like that when these ideas started to come out. Yeah, well, we we well remember the excitement. Um, the real excitement was to see nutrition plotted in a way where you can learn what it is important to the animal that you're working with. So at the time we were giving locusts and cockroaches, caterpillars, all sorts of insect species, different treatment groups had different combinations of food to select from. But regardless of the combination of food, their nutrient intake will all converge on a very specific point within our nutritional graph. Eureka, that's the point that's important to them. That will change their feeding behavior to achieve precisely that amount and balance of nutritional intake. They weren't maximizing anything. They weren't eating food according to availability. They were changing all of that to prioritize a certain nutrient intake. That must have to be, to be telling us something fundamental, and so it did. Yeah. So when the, when the rubber re meets the road, what do you hope to achieve with your work? What does that look like? Um, for me, it's a little thing called malnutrition is plaguing the planet in so many ways, overnutrition, undernutrition, and imbalanced nutrition, and they're all interrelated. And we, I think, beginning to see the Rosetta Stone that can help understand what is driving this. And, and the next step is to work towards getting these findings implemented in policy and other societal changes that will help correct the situation. And it's not just health. There are also fundamental relationships between planetary sustainability. In other words, the long-term health of the human species, human populations, and the health of the planet that sustains us. And all of these things are now bringing, being brought into that same systems perspective. And that's what I hope to achieve to make a difference. Exactly. So we, we're aiming to reinstate nutritional wisdom. I guess that's it simplifying nutrition to the point where we can really take advantage of the exquisitely evolved physiology and mechanisms that are there and if placed in the right environment will do their job yeah there's a lot of noise out there isn't there and i think if we just uh learn to get out, out of our own way and let let our bodies do what they're specifically exquisitely designed to do uh, will actually be okay. Um, I'm just wary of time. I know you guys are on a on a time limit, so I just wanted to thank you so much for taking some time to speak with me. I, I really think your work, um, you know, I, I put it up there as the most important work in nutrition uh, that is being done right now. I think it makes makes sense of so many different things, and uh, yeah, I, I thank you and commend you for doing the work you're doing and I, I can't wait to keep up with the publications that will come out in the future thank you thanks Cameron and thanks for having us on your podcast it's been great exactly. chatting with you Thank you so much for listening, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed this one. If you're interested in David and Stephen's work, I've left links to their incredible books and a couple of their salient publications in the episode notes. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can subscribe so you get notified whenever I release a new episode. I would also encourage you to leave a five-star review or give a thumbs up if you really like this episode. This is a simple, no-cost way to support my work and help me reach more listeners. Please feel free to leave comments on my YouTube channel as I do try to read through as many as I can. I've also put links to all of my social media platforms in the episode notes if you'd like updates about the podcast, information about health, or if you'd just like to reach out to me in general. So thanks again for listening, everyone. Take care.